The big question on everybody's mind heading into Game 6 of Suns Pelicans, will Devin Booker play? He's out, or is he? We'll break it down on today's episode of Locked on Suns. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past five seasons and a contributor at suns.com, as well as Dime Magazine. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen today and every day. As this playoff run continues, growing everywhere, I know more and more of you are listening. You all made a difference, those of you who are in the building for Game 5, and those of you who just held out hope. I heard a lot of uh, rumors that people were not interested in going to this game, that ticket prices were a little weird, resales were a little crazy, and it doesn't seem like people had faith. So even if you were watching from afar and you just maintained that faith, I think you deserve a big Pat on the back as well, but if you are here listening or watching, hit subscribe, hit follow, and join along for this ride. The Suns could clinch their first round series win on Thursday, an early game, 4.30 tips, so we have a lot to get to here. Start with Devin Booker, though. We'll get into some adjustments um, on each side of the ball here and what the Pelicans might do now that their backs are against the walls, but the big question, as I said, heading into game six is whether Devin Booker will play. And I don't have a great answer for that because there's battling, dueling stories on each side. What I mean by that is start with post-game, after game five. You see Devin Booker in videos from people who are nearby sitting in the stands that Booker is yelling to the Pelicans players and coaches and everything on the bench as the Suns walk off the court, I'm back says it a couple times. You can read his lips, even if you maybe can't quite hear him. And okay, so maybe he's coming in in game six. Maybe that meant that now that there's only one game to go, maybe he feels well enough. It's time. Okay, sure. I think a lot of us came away from last night thinking that might be the case. Well, what happens after that is the Suns, James Jones appears on 98.7 Arizona's sports station. And uh, he says... Every day, every hour, he feels better, talking about Booker. But for right now, we're going, to, we're going into tomorrow's game, expecting the guys that have been in the rotation and in uniform to take the court and play a very competitive t- game. As of today, he is out. Tomorrow, I could probably have a better gauge when we get closer to game time if he is ready. But given we are, where we are today, he is out. I think that it's hilarious. Um, of course, Jones went on to say something that he said time and again, which is, if a guy is healthy and wants to play, he plays. So that comes out. Right after that is when the Suns release their official injury report. So he's listed as questionable? No, he's listed out on the injury report, which for what it's worth, just for those who are maybe wondering, that's not binding. Like they're able to to put, they could list Chris Paul as out and then he could play tomorrow and he's not even injured. Like that's, it's not official. It's not official until 45 minutes before tip when teams are required to submit that official starting lineup, and we don't need to know anything until then. But still very strange. There's so much in between out and active. Doubtful, questionable, probable, we know all of that. Why not put him doubtful? It's just a very bizarre thing to do if the GM is openly saying he may play and he's going to be listed as out. Well then, shortly after that, we get a report from Adrian Wojnarowski at ESPN who says, Phoenix Suns all-star guard Devin Booker is progressing on a return soon, possibly for Game 6 on Thursday or a potential Game 7 on Saturday, which would be obviously back here in Phoenix. Woj goes on to say Booker has made significant progress. There's momentum on a return in the coming days, is his wording there. The expectation is that Booker would return in limited minutes. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a GM who I think is being coy. I think that's probably the most we can really say. Um, Jones is sort of playing the same game that Monty Williams was playing when he was originally asked about it. If you remember, Williams said, oh, we didn't give a timeline. 
You know, that didn't come from us, even though it had been reported by Wendy and by Woj separately, although those were a little bit uh, contradictory stories at that time even. And I think Monty probably knew it wasn't worth wading into any of that. And it also keeps the opponent guessing. It keeps future opponents guessing. Nobody, as evidenced by the fact that I'm sitting here uh, wondering aloud, trying to sift through it for all of you guys, nobody knows what's going on with Booker. Nobody knows the, the level of strength that the Suns are at right now. And that benefits them if they can continue to win, which they have. Benefits them to be sort of ahead of the curve in that way. So all of that to say, it feels like there's a very strong chance that Devin Booker plays in game six. I would think that that, uh, the key point in that Woj story is probably the expectation is that Booker would return in limited minutes because... A, that tells me that they've actually had a conversation about what his return would look like, that it's not just let's wake up tomorrow and and see a pure hypothetical, maybe he'll recover miraculously. It's like, no, we've noticed enough progress where we're going to have real conversations about what he looks like and what the restrictions and all of that might be when he does return. And B, the restricted minutes thing makes it seem... uh, It gives us some insight into what the game will look like, and that's where I want to go next. So Booker in limited minutes, what does that mean? Well, the place that I really start, more so than anything else, in terms of uh, imagining what type of impact he could have on the game, is the fourth quarter. It's not even the first quarter. It's not the third quarter, which I think the Pelicans may have won every single third quarter in this series, if not at least the majority. It's not any of that. It's the fourth quarter. Because in game four, that's when things really got out of hand. There's been some conversation about, is Chris Paul tired? Which I guess we can get to a little bit in a second when I talk about the backcourt. But the fourth quarter is, I think, where you would really see the impact of Devin Booker. Because in game one, Chris Paul goes supernova in that fourth quarter. And it does. it's not necessary for Booker to do much. Game two, Booker gets injured in the third quarter and is not even available in the fourth quarter. Game three, the Suns win because, again, Chris Paul steps up. Game four, Chris Paul looks very off. And then in game five, it's really Mikhail Bridges and the defense and the intensity and some of that stuff that gives the Suns the win. So we haven't seen the normal Suns, which is to say that Booker is the closer. Even the game that he was healthy, he wasn't quite that. And if you have a game where the Suns can play with the level of intensity and uh, execution that they did in game five and get a closer vintage sort of Devin Booker performance. If maybe you, maybe you only see him, maybe his minutes limit is 20 or 25. Maybe you only see him for 10 or so minutes in the first three quarters. Maybe he just plays, you know, four minutes at the beginning of the first, four minutes at the end of the second, four minutes at the beginning of the third. And then he plays most of the entire fourth quarter. And he could really save his energy and and be impactful. That's where I would look. I do think there's a real chance that he plays. You combine his confidence when he's barking at the opposing team with James Jones leaving the door open for it and now Woj doubling down. That's three indicators that it's at least a possibility, if not if we're taking Booker's word, uh, a likelihood. So with that all said, the Pelicans will adjust. That is for certain. They have been... A very well coached and a very confident team every step of the way, and I don't expect that to change. So we'll get into could a starting lineup change happen? I think that's the first place to start. First, though, guys, today's show brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source all year long for sports betting stats and info. Find all the latest developments across the world of sports, including league analysis and news on this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the baseball season. BetOnline, your continued source for sports wagering info, including live betting, esports, and more. I have a line for you. I'm going to give you the latest on the N- let me see NBA specials for... Oh, there's four of them. Let me click them. Oh, I like this one. This one came up on the Locked On uh, Network Twitter feed. They posted a graphic today. Kyrie Irving's next team, if not the Nets. So forget the Suns. I get anxious betting on teams that I like, so probably you guys are not looking to put money on the Suns. Kyrie Irving's next team, if it's not the Nets. Plus 150 for the Clippers, plus 300 for the Mavericks. Here's the one that I like. 
plus 500 for the Chicago Bulls. That seemed very interesting to me because there's a Nikola Vucevic thing going on. There is a DeMar DeRozan. There's also Zach Levine's free agency. There's a lot of big contracts. There's a lot of question marks about that team going forward. It's fun to imagine. So maybe throw some money on there. Head to the website today, guys. Again, that's betonline.net or use their mobile app to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. So if we assume that Devin Booker has a decent chance, if not a good chance, to play here in game six on the road, 4.30 local tip, which I'm sure many of you will be rearranging your work schedules, if at all possible, to catch the game. The Pelicans are going to have answers. They're not just going to say, okay, Devin Booker's playing, roll, roll over, game, series over. Yeah, fun while it lasted. No, of course not. Willie Green has been a very solid coach throughout this entire series. I expect he will go not quietly. So, is this the time, is this the moment when we finally see a starting lineup change? I was saying this after game one. I think a lot of people were that Hayes looked lost. But then, of course, we know in game two, Willie Green adjusted by having Jackson Hayes run out and transition more, punish the Suns that way. That's how Devin Booker gets hurt. So, uh, tragic, obviously. But Hayes continues to be sort of the obvious chess piece to change up the starting lineup. I would put it at 50 50, but that's higher than I would have said at any point. Since game two, I think games three, four, and five, I went in saying Hayes will certainly start. But now the Pelicans are, you know, game away from elimination. They need to get a little bit more desperate. So I do think there's a chance Hayes leaves the lineup. If that happens, I think the number one candidate for a replacement would be Larry Nance Jr. And I think here's what that would do. Because if you just take Hayes out and go small, I think the issue becomes you're playing into the Suns' hands. That's the adjustment that the Suns bring out of teams, right? They, We thought that even in the finals last year. Brooke Lopez ended, ends up making a pretty decent impact, but I think really at the end of the day, uh, the Suns sort of opened themselves up to the small ball lineup that the Bucks were able to beat them with. It was sort of this catch-22 thing, and we saw it at times against the Clippers where Ivica Zubats didn't play. The, the Suns sort of bring out that, that desire to go small, And I think it favors them, especially in a series like this where the Suns' personnel is just better, right? If you take Hayes out and you put, let's say, Trey Murphy in there or um, even Jose Alvarado and and go a little bit more traditional, any of that stuff, the Suns start to match up better. So I think what Nance does is he allows you to stay big. He allows you to go to that small lineup after one sub, you know, instead of Nance himself being the first sub in, you could say Valanchunas gets subbed out first, and then you bring in Alvarado or Murphy or Najee Marshall, and now you're really in that versatile small ball with with uh, Nance at the five type of lineup that you want to be in for a lot of the game anyway. So I think Nance is probably number one, but I also think it's worth considering if it is Jose Alvarado, because this brings it to some of the Chris Paul tired thing. And I don't want to necessarily lend uh, too much credence to the conspiracy or uh, dramatic theories that Pelicans fans are kind of cooking up online. But, you know, on the YouTube comments here and in different spots, I have definitely seen some Chris Paul is, uh, you know, on on fumes right now. I don't agree whatsoever. (laughs) Let me just say that. I don't agree whatsoever. Chris Paul in game five was not his most efficient self. Was continu- He's missed jumpers that we are used to seeing him make all series long. I'll, I'll, I'll admit all of that. But at the end of the day, you look up at the box score, he's still 22 points, 8 of 18, which I mean, like that's like what, 45% from the field? It's not that ugly. 11 assists, 6 free throws, 6 rebounds. So, and he's been attacking the basket more in this series than he did at, at any game in the regular season, it feels like. I just don't see a drop-off. I can see looking at game four and saying something was wrong. I mean, I was on this podcast saying, is the hand injured, the left hand, where was people in the arena at that time saying that they saw Chris Paul's left hand being worked on. It's difficult to know the truth there. The Suns are never going to tell us what's going on. Like, I think that he hasn't been himself in certain spots. 
he's definitely not been the guy who, you know, slayed the Clippers with 41 points or, you know, broke down the Denver Nuggets defense into dust. He's not been that guy. But I also, the argument that he's sort of cooked here or that the, you know, the Suns are, can't expect the normal Chris Paul anymore. He played 39 minutes and he was still out there in the fourth quarter doing damage. So I don't get that at all. I don't think Alvarado is a guy that you can extend to be a 30, 40 minute player in a playoff series. I think his energy wouldn't last. You even see that with guys like Patrick Beverly or others who have been doing it for much longer than Alvarado. You can't sustain that level of peskiness and obnoxiousness for that long, especially when you're an offensively limited player. Alvarado is not much of a distributor. He's really a straight line scorer, a spot up three point shooter and a an on-ball defender. And he's very good in that role, but I don't think he's much of a starter. And I don't think you want to make, you don't want to wear him out and, and all of that stuff. You want to save him to make sure that Chris Paul continues to be a little bit less than his best. The last thing is though, if the Suns do want to be more ready for Booker and Paul defensively, what they could do is start Najee Marshall or Trey Murphy. And what that would allow them to do is to maybe have Herb Jones on Chris Paul still, and then maybe to have Marshall on Booker. So that would allow McCollum to still continue to sort of be hidden on defense. It would make it so that Brandon Ingram is not having to do as much work defensively against Booker, which I think is part of why Ingram has been so good offensively since Booker went down, is he's able to fully focus his energy on scoring. And, and playmaking and all of that rather than having to chase Booker around and play so much defense. So that's an option too. But I think Marshall has been, he was good, great in games one and two, not so great in games three through five. And Trey Murphy, the past, I think actually three through five as well, all of those games has been not great either and didn't even take a shot in game five. So I think I lean Nance and I think it could happen. So the Suns should be ready for a little bit more versatility there, a little bit of a different pick and roll attack, some more floor spacing than Hayes gives them, all the things that Nance does. He hasn't been awesome from you know moment to moment in this series, but he's probably been their sixth best player ahead of Alvarado, ahead of anybody else. So he's probably the guy to get the, the nod. I don't think Hayes would play much if he's not in the starting lineup. So you might be looking at a pretty heavy dose of Larry Nance and some rotation changes around that. The other part I want to talk about that I think the Suns should be expecting is could C.J. McCollum finally have the big game that I think Pelicans fans have been expecting and that Suns fans maybe have been scared of. So let's get to that in a second. First though, guys, today's show brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's impossible to walk into a local chain auto parts store to get everything that you need and count on it being reasonably priced, getting to your door on time and all of that. So why endure that intimidating questioning, pointless pointless questioning, and wait while the person checks their computer, tells you the overpriced amount you're going to have to pay, and the date four weeks into the future that you might have to wait for, when you could go to rockauto.com. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. They're a family business, guys. They've been doing it. Your, they've been doing it, serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, and they've been doing that on the internet. They've been an online car parts company for over 20 years. How many people can even say that they've had any online company for 20 years? It's a very select few, but it means that they know the importance of efficiency and value. So go explore their easy to use website today to find the solution for your auto parts needs. That's rockauto.com. See all the parts available for your car or truck and write locked on in there. How did you hear about us box? So they know we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices and all the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com. CJ McCollum was 21 points on 7 of 22 shooting in game 5. He made a big 3 at toward the end of the game. Um, I, well, he's been doing that all series. He got blocked on a 3 uh, at one point as well. I think the, game, the big 3 I'm talking about at the end of the game was game 4. Game 5, he's worse. He hasn't had a huge assist game. He hasn't had a very efficient night. Now, I do want to get into some specifics there. So understanding he's not been fantastic, but what does that really mean? So take game five here. He was seven of 22 from the field, but eight of his attempts were threes. One of his makes were three. So if you take that off, he was six of 14 from two-point range. 
Now remember, he's a he's an undersized wing, basically. He's an undersized combo guard. It's about 6'3 or, or whatever he, you know, is listed at. 6 of 14 is pretty decent. I also think that CJ is a guy who it feels very throwback, especially now that he's not with Dame, where the Pelicans are, you know, their offense is, is going to, everything has to be Ingram. At, at the bottom, you know, at the end of the day, fourth quarter, close game, you want Ingram taking that shot. McCollum is sort of this change of pace scorer where he's going to attack quickly. And I think actually he could, if, as he continues to build out his game into the you know back half of his prime and he's on a different team where he isn't playing with Dame, I almost wonder if, if he could build out a little bit more of his handle and playmaking and become more of a point guard because he, he almost moves too fast sometimes where he takes the first shot available and it's not always a great one. He's sort of this guy who gets to his spot. A lot of the time it's going to be from inefficient spots on the floor. Pull up threes, pull up twos, floaters, things like that. Those are the most difficult shots in basketball. And he kind of just takes them right when they appear. And so, look, six again, 6 of 14 is not an ugly game when you put it into perspective that way. But it also sort of means, to me at least, that's not going to change. You know, he's not a player who plays this deliberate style it's hard for him to really get downhill unless he just beats you off the dribble, but he's not the guy who's going to finish through contact or you know leap up in the air and dunk on your head. It's not the type of offensive player that he is. So I don't know how much changes. If he's going to attack and take those quick shots when they're there, play off of Ingram, take a lot of threes, and he doesn't really have room to sort of change up his approach right now, and you throw in that Bridges is, is likely to continue to play good defense. And another and, last but not least, uh, I think the Suns have really gotten something interesting, if not just flat out good or great here going with Holiday as sort of the secondary CJ defender. And this is something I didn't talk about a ton in yesterday's recap show when I was talking about Bridges defending Ingram so well, is that part of the reason that that arrangement worked for the Suns is, well, one, they they kind of needed to go to it because Crowder was in foul trouble, which I did talk about, but Aaron Holiday was able to defend CJ McCollum. And so having that point of attack defender, which I've said for a while that I believe Aaron Holiday is probably the second best point of attack defender on this team behind Bridges, and I think Monty went to him in large part because of that, that allows... 48 minutes, basically, of good defense against McCullough. I'm not saying no one else will ever guard him. We know the Suns have been switching a ton. So there's opportunities for CJ to be matched up against players that he can beat off the bounce or maybe smaller players like Shamit or Payne who he can shoot over the top of if they don't play him physically uh, around screens and whatnot. But all of that leads me to believe that I don't see a way that McCollum, unless he just goes ballistic, making difficult shots at an incredibly high rate, which is totally within reason. I mean, he's a guy who can score 40-50 with his shooting ability. Unless that happens, I don't just see a sort of a regression to the mean where McCollum has this, you know, 50% shooting, 35-point night sort of playing the same style that he has been. It feels very, I don't want to say feast or famine because he's taking so many shots that even when he's inefficient, he's still getting his points. It's not a famine. But he's going to go very big, or he's going to stay right where he's been. I don't see a middle where he's all that much more impactful. So I see Pelicans fans, you know, pleading or sort of praying for this explosion from McCollum. And I see Suns fans, I've seen some sort of like, well, is that going to happen? It hasn't happened yet, whatever. I think it hasn't happened yet because of the way he plays for this Pelicans team and because of the way that the Suns have been able to guard him. And it's not just the point of attack defenders. It's also Aiton who... I think it gets lost, actually, with how much offensive rebounding has been a problem because part of that has been that Aiton is able to successfully contest so many of those drives. When McCollum, if McCollum gets past Bridges or Holiday or whoever is guarding him, Aiton has been so good when it is a pick-and-roll situation at being right there and being able to contest that shot as a last line of room protection. And with all of that combined, I, I, I don't think there's going to be that McCollum night. I think he could easily score 20-25 like he's been doing, but some sort of 40-point miraculous 
you know, efficient night where he just makes a bunch of the shots that he's been missing doesn't seem super likely to me. But could be wrong. He's a great player. Uh, that's part of the reason you need Booker, you know, if, if he's if he's able to go and you need that intensity and that execution level that we saw in Game 5. This team is not an easy one to beat. I think the Suns have them sort of where they want them. I think if the Suns just replicate what they did in Game 5, even if Booker's not back, they can win. If Booker is back, I really think they have a good chance. But uh, look, I mean, we saw what it can look like when Ingram is great. That happened in Game 4. Um, you know, we've seen what it looks like when the role players step up. That's what happened in Game 2 and in Game 4. So... Not projecting some sort of blowout, just, you know, glorious win. But I do feel good about the Suns tonight. I think that they close it out. And uh, we'll we'll follow it all. We have one more show. That will be a recap of Game 6. Aaron Edwards will be here again. You're getting a lot of bonus, Aaron, this week and throughout the playoffs. We'll do more recap shows with him going forward. So that's what you have to look forward to. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that follow button wherever you're listening and watching. And now go make Locked On NBA your second listen to get caught up on everything going around the league on Wednesday night.